Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to dive into some of the real stuff of synthesis. We've done a little preparatory work talking about notes and MIDI. Now we want to talk about how we turn some notes that we got, some key presses that we got from MIDI into notes, and those notes into sounds. So this is the fun part of synthesis. I hope everyone's doing well out there, and I really look forward to talking to you today. So let's get started. So the fancy name generative synthesis means that instead of trying to modify a sound that we got from somewhere else, we typically are trying to generate a sound from scratch. We're doing the equivalent of CGI, but in the audio world. And so that's kind of a really neat concept. And what we typically use is simple waveforms that we combine together and filters. That's sort of the starting point for a lot of what we do in synthesis. A great pre-electronics example of a synthesizer, an additive synthesizer, is a pipe organ. It's a series of pipes. I assume you've all seen the ranks of a pipe organ at some point that each pipe produces a single note with a single tonal value and we add up pipes when we press a key on the pipe organ we add up pipes to produce a complicated sound and this was all done with completely mechanical or pre-mechanical technologies and yet it can sound fantastic when analog electronics came along one of the first things we did was build the electronic version of that we replaced all those pipes with analog circuits and got the electric organ which absolutely took the world by storm because while a pipe organ can start at fifty to a hundred thousand dollars and work up a electronic organ even in the old days could start at a few thousand dollars and so maybe it didn't sound quite as nice but it had its own properties it was more flexible it was more versatile it was very much less expensive and so in a lot of venues, the pipe organs just went away. So how does this work? What's the principle at play here? Well, it's simple. It's the principle that any complex sound that's periodic can be represented as the sum of sine waves, as a sum of periodic sinusoids. And we've been talking about this the whole time, and this is one of the places where it really comes into play. I can figure out what I want my sound to sound like, throw some sine waves together and off I go. But carried to its logical extreme, that can be sort of impractical. It can take a lot of sinusoids to produce what you want. And of course, sounds, music isn't really periodic in the frequency domain sense. We change sounds every time we push or lift a key on our keyboard and so we have to deal with all of that and so there's a whole bunch of tricks that are thrown in to make this whole notion of additive and subtractive generative synthesis practicable so the first trick is to say well maybe we shouldn't start with pure sinusoids Remember, if I give you a distorted sinusoid, it typically has harmonics. The harmonics here are multiples of the fundamental frequency. They're essentially octaves, now that we know what an octave is. And they may be even octaves or odd octaves, but they sweep up the frequency thing. And so for the price of generating one distorted sinusoid, I can generate the equivalent of a whole bunch of undistorted sinusoids all in one smooth motion. And so it's very typical in analog synthesis and even in a lot of kinds of digital synthesis to use different distorted waveforms to get different harmonic stuff to work with. And the square wave, if you'll recall, has strong odd harmonics. Triangles and other waves have odd harmonics and sometimes even some even harmonics. And so with those harmonics in play, I get a much richer sound and without really paying the price of having to add up a lot of stuff to get it. I mean, this is essentially the plan of the pipe organ. You make power of two pipe links for each note. Those are called ranks. And so you get these octave, and they aren't always power of two. A lot of times they have other interesting ratios. 
And so when I play a key, I can pull in or out the various stops associated with the ranks so that when I play a key, I get different mixes of the ranks of an organ pipe that's supposed to be for the note I'm playing. And that can be really, really a powerful trick. But of course, you can't have that many ranks of organ pipes. If you have a few dozen, it's an amazing giant organ. And so you might want to start with distorted sinusoids, and indeed they do. They hack up the organ pipes so they produce more interesting sounds that aren't exactly sine waves, and that gives them some harmonic content to play with. So, yeah, we mix all this stuff together, and off we go. And when we build a synthesizer, we do the exact same thing. The synthesizer has something in it, typically, if it's an old analog synthesizer called a voltage-controlled oscillator. Remember, I promised a while back we'd be talking about voltage-controlled things. But think of voltage, like I said before, as a parameter. In this case, the main thing that the oscillator is going to be controlled for, typically, is frequency. And in fact, like I said before, the early synthesizers tended to be monophonic, only one sound at a time. And so when you pressed a key, you didn't actually activate some unique oscillator. You activated the oscillator or the couple of oscillators. And a voltage was put into the oscillators to say what frequency they should be at. And so if that was tuned real, real accurately, you'd be in tune. That was its whole own art. And so I could play a note that sounded really super rich and clear. If you listen to something like a mini Moog, which is really easy to find tracks of on SoundCloud or wherever, you'll hear some really amazing rich sounds that start with just a couple of oscillators generating waveform. So that's kind of neat. But if I just start and stop abruptly, start when the key is pushed down, stop when the key is released, I get kind of a boring sound. This is the classic organ sound, although pipe organs tended to run on a little after you let go because they had air pressure stored up in them. It was actually very complicated. A pipe organ has a chamber with bellows that maintain air pressure some fancy way, and so the volume you're getting out of the organ has to do with how that thing called the wind chest is pressurized right now, and that can get really complicated. It takes its whole own modeling thing. For an electric organ, one of the defects that made an electric organ sound like an electric organ is that it was absolutely, you, when the key switch got to the on position, your note started, and when you let go of the key and it got to the off position, your note stopped, and there wasn't any messing around, typically. That isn't very realistic in terms of how natural instruments sound, and it isn't very pleasant a lot of times. And so, as we got fancier, we started putting a volume envelope on the waveforms so that the output would vary in volume over time. And the typical thing to do is to have some stuff happen as you press the key down, have some other stuff happen as you let the key go. And so if you held the key down, you'd get a nice sustained regular sound typically, although you might want to have it change slowly over time there too. But at the beginning and end of the note, you could make some interesting effects, and that actually made for a lot wider range of interesting sounds you could do. The... Once you've got this idea of doing interesting things at various points in the note, sure, you can use that to control the amplitude of the note. You could also use it to control the frequency of the note. You could also use it to control the filtering of the note. And so these envelope generators, as they're called, are used throughout a typical synthesizer to get interesting effects around a note. The traditional thing is something called the ADSR, the Attack Decay Sustain Release Envelope. And this is an absolutely standard way of specifying how a note behaves in terms of whatever envelope parameter you're controlling. And it starts with an attack. So if you're controlling the volume of the sound, it starts with, as you start at the start of the note, it doesn't just immediately turn on because that'll produce a click, as we know because that's how 
uh, instant turn on looks in the frequency domain. Instead, what happens is that it ramps up the volume a little bit at the start of the note so that you get something that still may start pretty fast but doesn't sound clicky is normally what you want. And that may ramp up to a very high level. And then just after that, we start a ramp back down the decay phase where that initial impulse falls off. And so if you turn the attack way up, the amplitude at the peak of the attack way up, then you can get a really plucky sound, but still under your control. And if you want a smooth thing, then you essentially have your attack ramp slowly up to the sustain level and you get a nice smooth sound. The sustain level is sort of the constant, typically hold level when the decay is complete. Now, your ADSR envelope may let you set some decay even during the sustain phase, set some ramp down even during the sustain phase because that's a thing that real instruments do. There again, if, you, if you're holding a chord on your organ, the wind chest is gonna get depleted some and your volume's gonna go down a little until everything balances out. But if you just keep it constant, it's still pretty nice. And then the other thing that you typically want is that when you let go, it doesn't just immediately stop. After the cue is released, you probably want some decay as well. If you hold down the sustain pedal on a piano and play a note, when you let go, the note isn't really damped or anything, it just keeps decaying. Even though you've let go the note, the key off has happened and you're off somewhere else. And those kind of effects are what you can get with long releases. Typically releases are shorter than that, but there again, you typically don't want to abruptly turn off the sound because there again, you'll get a clicking effect that will be super unpleasant. And the other thing to keep in mind that's really easy to forget when you're down in the bowels of building your synthesizer is that volume is in decibels, it's log scaled, right? So these ramps, I'm describing them as sort of linear ramps, which is typically how they look. Oh, really, that's linear in the log scale domain. So you gotta be really careful about that or it's gonna look really kind of weird. Also, obviously, you know, really it doesn't have to be all pointy. You don't have a, necessarily a triangle that corresponds to attack, decay, and then another triangle for sustain and another triangle for release. It, you may want to smooth those so that they look prettier. It doesn't make that much difference. And a lot of times everybody just uses linear ramps. But pretty much every kind of synthesis has this envelope problem. And ADSR envelopes are the standard way to do it. There's a link here to a very nice article that I very much like about ADSR envelopes and how to use them. And I can highly recommend looking at that envelope article and understanding, you know, playing with its examples and understanding what's going on there. Essential part of synthesis. We've talked before about tremolo and vibrato, right? And so if I have a voltage controlled analog oscillator, right? I can imagine putting a sinusoid at low frequency, maybe one to three cycles a second, wiggling it a tiny bit and getting a wavy effect in frequency. Or I can imagine taking a voltage controlled amplifier and wiggling it a little bit a few times a second to get a wavery volume, right? So tremolo, the amplitude modulation effect from a voltage controlled amplifier, vibrato, you know, frequency domain waviness from the from a voltage controlled oscillator. And so the soft components of these have the obvious implementations, right? I can modulate the gain multiplier in my soft synthesizer to get a tremolo effect. I can modulate the frequency parameter, the time parameter in my uh, oscill in my sine wave generator in my soft synthesizer to get a vibrato effect. And so adding some tremolo and vibrato adds a lot of life to the sound. And there again, may make it sound more real or at least more interesting. And so that's done really, really commonly as an effect. And for that to happen in an old analog synthesizer, you had to have some extra oscillators lying around to do the low frequency oscillator thing. You didn't necessarily need one per key, which was nice. So typically on an electronic organ or whatever, 
you would probably use one or two low frequency oscillators that control that mo that moderated the voltage controlled amplifier or voltage controlled oscillator in every for every key so that's nice <laughs> another trick old electric organs used to use is something called the leslie they literally would take the speaker and hook it to a motor and spin it around inside the organ cabinet that produces a really really interesting low frequency modulated sound uh it's very hard to simulate with well with soft circuits or even analog or whatever but it's an, sort of an amazing effect that those days are gone <laughs> now if i'm going to generate all this harmonic content that's very nice. This is all what we call additive synthesis. We've got all these all these sinusoids flowing through our system. I might want to modulate that. I might want to do what's called subtractive synthesis where I actually take some frequencies down uh, to change the shape of the sound. And that filter may want to be voltage controlled too. That filter may want to be parametric controlled so that I can sort of round off my square wave or sawtooth waves higher harmonics with a low pass filter I can emphasize some particular frequency with a band pass filter there's a lot that goes into these controllable filters the the those filters too can be controlled by a low frequency oscillator and maybe by an ADSR envelope and so now you're starting to get into a really interesting range with your effects. The last thing is noise. It's very common in a synthesizer to have a plain old noise generator. And you would typically there again run that noise through a filter to shape it subtractively. And it would be nice to have a low pass filter to set the max frequency. And that would be nice to have as a controlled filter. And the other thing that noise is good for, in the analog days, this was a giant pain in the neck. In the digital days, it's literally trivial, is to sort of use it at very slow noise scales to produce a random kind of effect. So I can literally have my note modulated by a low frequency, you know, random square wave and sort of jump up and down. And you can get some really, really interesting effects that way. And of course, speaking of effects, we have all the effects we've talked about previously, and you may want to throw any or all of them or multiples of them into your synthesizer because just like they make other things sound nice, they make synthesis sound nice, output sound nice too. So it isn't like synthesis and effects are exclusive. You can do some things with the synth that would be hard to do with effects, but similarly, you can do some things with effects that would be hard to do with just straight synthesis. And in particular, it's very common to have reverb and various delay effects like we've talked about before as part of your synthesis solution. So your soft synthesizer or digital synthesizer is likely to have that in there as well to produce a more interesting sound. And, of course, you have this cool thing in additive subtractive synthesis and generative synthesis where we can turn the knobs. You hopefully have some knobs on your controller and modulate the sound in real time, which is a thing that even with an electric organ or a pipe organ, you don't typically go moving the stops around in the middle of the song. But here I really can. I can tweak things as I go to get some really, really amazing effects. And in fact, most MIDI keyboards have a pitch wheel and a mod wheel. The difference being that the pitch wheel is spring-loaded and the mod wheel is not spring-loaded, so you can set it somewhere it'll stay there. And the other difference is that sort of traditionally in a synthesizer, the pitch wheel does what its name implies. I can bend the pitch up or down with it. When I let go, it'll go back to being in tune, ideally. The mod wheel is typically used for modulating other things, for modulating 
LFO speeds or LFO depths or whatever it is I want to do. And if you're building your own soft synth, of course, you don't have to make the pitch wheel control your pitch. You can make it control something else if you have something interesting for it. To and in fact, a lot of synthesizers would do things like have the pitch wheel push in one direction to mod modulate pitch and push the other direction to modulate something else. And if you don't have enough knobs or the right kind of knobs, there's a ton of MIDI controllers out there that you can hook right up into your MIDI pipeline and have extra knobs and buttons and push pads and foot switches and foot pedals. You know, almost any kind of control you can imagine wanting. Probably if you scrounge around hard enough and are willing to pay enough, you can find a commercial version of it. And if not, MIDI stuff isn't that hard to build. If you're into embedded, it's kind of a fun thing to do. And so you can build, build or buy some really fancy controllers, which is a thing that is pretty unique, really, to soft synthesis. Uh, analog synthesis, you could kind of do it too, but not so much because voltages and potentiometers are a pain in the neck and there's sort of limits on how clever you could get. Certainly with old mechanical instruments, you know, they weren't very moddable. But these things, yeah, whatever controls you want, we'll prob we can probably glue them on. And, you know, when you think of synthesis, you probably think of weird sounds uh, that sound like they came from a synthesizer. You think of Van Halen's Jump or whatever, where you're like, I know what I'm listening to here. I'm listening to a synthesizer. But, of course, a big part of synthesis also is to try to simulate natural instruments, orchestral instruments or whatever. Strings turn out to be pretty easy if you're thinking about orchestra strings that are padded a lot of them play together that's not a terrible sound to achieve and because it consists mostly of some really beautiful shimmery harmonics you, you play with a few effects and, it's, and you get it together wind instruments are harder you're going to have to throw some noise in to simulate breath noise you're going to have to play games with resonant filters because wind instruments are very resonant you're going to have to be really careful about your envelope because wind instruments have really interesting envelopes and if you voice every note the same then it's going to sound strange but you know you can have some pretty fun saxophone or whatever effects you know that you synthesize if that's the way you want to go. Brass instruments are harder because their frequency changes in weird ways over time. They are essentially subtractive instruments. For those of you who don't know how a trumpet works, essentially a trumpet works like this. And that sort of buzzy noise that I buzz into the trumpet is going to be resonated with by the trumpet to produce an output note that depends on how I've got the valve set so that it changes the resonance of that cavity. That's a little fancier, but you can still get some okay-ish approximations, I guess. Plucked strings are the worst. Uh, if, you, if you listen to anybody's harpsichord synthesizer and then listen to a real harpsichord, you're going to be very, very disappointed in the result. If you listen to somebody's acoustic guitar synthesizer and then listen to an acoustic guitar, you're, you're not happy. Essentially, the stuff that's going on with those instruments is very, very complicated, and you almost have to do a real physical simulation. We've gotten reasonably good at pianos, but the amount of work that's gone into making pianos sound decent, pure synthesized, modeled pianos, is sort of amazing to get where we did. And you're still going to prefer the Yamaha, whoever, Steinway Concert Grand to some synthesis of that. The way well, you cheat, of course, which is a good way to close up, is you give up partially on our plan of just synthesizing these instruments and you say well maybe we should capture sounds we find in nature and set up somehow so that we can or you know in the orchestra or wherever and set up somehow so that we can play notes of that sound 
by pressing a key. That's what's called sampling synthesis or wavetable synthesis, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about next time. So that was kind of a whirlwind tour through synthesis. I think we're going to need some more examples and some more practice to get used to these ideas, but hopefully that gave you a start. In the next lecture, we'll look through the insides of some soft synthesizers I've built and talk about the various kinds of synthesis you can do and how you might implement it. And that should be a nice complement to all this theory. So hopefully that was helpful. It's great to talk to you. Hope you're doing well, and I will talk to you again soon.